Our scripture passage this morning is from Mark chapter 14, Mark 14, and we're going to read the first 11 verses there. In these weeks leading up to Easter, um, we're going to hit on some things that I've never like really preached on in depth. Usually we cover all of this material, usually we cover all of this material at our Maundy Thursday services. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole lot of stories in just the, the few short hours leading up to Jesus' crucifixion that we, that we talk about ordinarily on Monday, Thursday. But I wanted to, wanted to break those things up a little bit this year and actually preach through some of these texts and uh, hit them with a little bit more depth. And so um, Mark chapter 14 is one of those. Again, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. If you're reading from your pew Bibles, 1578, otherwise the words will be on the screen. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his, Jesus' head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, What we just heard is a story about expensive perfume. Well, not exactly. Um, It wasn't used for for perfume. It's not like Nard was um, used for uh, kind of prettying a a woman up and and making her smell nice, but we'll we'll get to that. Uh, However, it was a good smelling thing from what I understand, and it probably filled the room with a beautiful aroma when this woman broke it and then poured it over Jesus. First of all, I want to talk about how Mark tells this story, because he tells it in a very particular way. He, He actually includes it in a larger story, a larger story about the the rejection of Jesus. And the the desperation, the growing desperation of the religious leaders of Israel um, to to get rid of Jesus, to to silence him, to to kill him, and so um, so that's the that's the larger story, and then and then the story about the woman breaking the um, the jar of perfume of, of nard and pouring it on Jesus is kind of kind of encapsulated in that. In the opening couple of verses, we're told of a plot that was being concocted by the scribes and the chief priests to capture and kill Jesus. And then at the end of the story, in verses 10 and 11, we kind of return to that um, larger story, and we learn how the scribes and the chief priests were going to accomplish that goal, namely um, by kind of winning over Judas and having him corrupted and betraying Jesus. That's the outer shell of the story, this dark and sinister and somber theme. But within that larger narrative, as I said, there's this beautiful story that, that kind of, I think, Mark intends it to, uh, to create this, this awesome contrast. And I also think it's a very clever way to tell a story because it contrasts, it highlights the contrast between things like light and darkness. 
and love and betrayal, which is perfectly fitting, to jump ahead a little bit, to our own context and, and really the context that we've had ever since Jesus walked the earth because, you know, the contrast is, the big contrast in life is, do you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or do you reject him? There couldn't be two different responses to Jesus and there couldn't be two different outcomes as a result of those responses. But regardless, back to the story, a woman comes to Jesus and gives him the very best thing she has to offer because she has accepted him, because she loves him. Now, this woman was obviously very, very devoted to Jesus, very devoted to Jesus. And so the contrast, that that contrast between the darkness around and the light in this little story couldn't be greater. The contrast between the the greater betrayal of Jesus and, and this beautiful devotion of this woman could not be greater. Mark tells us that this story takes place uh, in Bethany, which is uh, a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. And, And it's at the home of a man called Simon the leper. Simon the leper, not a nickname that I would want to have. But some people in our congregation have some pretty weird nicknames too. But. So it's, a, it's a, at the home of a man called Simon the leper. And, and you know, Mark, at least in his gospel, he doesn't tell us um, who the woman was. But, but if this is the same story that's recorded in the gospel of John chapter 12, then this is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And Bethany is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who um, most of you will remember was recently raised from the dead by Jesus, that's where they all lived. Now, just to add a little layer of um, intrigue here, historically, although there's really not all that much evidence for it, it was believed that Simon the leper was actually the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And, you know, that said, it actually would be the case that uh, he must be Simon, the former leper, because, of course, lepers were cut off from all social contact with anyone in society. And so, regardless of what you think about Simon, the leper being the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, um, you know, this was very, very likely a celebration of either Lazarus being raised from the dead or perhaps Simon being healed of his leprosy by Jesus. So it's just something to consider. And um, just to add a little bit to the context, there are probably about probably about 20 people in this home. You have the the 12 disciples and Jesus. You have Simon the leper and Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then perhaps some other members of Simon the leper's immediate family. And there are three aspects to this story, to this account. Three aspects of this act performed to or upon Jesus that I want to look at this morning. First, I I want to look at this, um, the aspect that that this act was a wasteful thing. And secondly, I want to look at the aspect that this act was a beautiful thing. And and thirdly, um, I I want to look at this act as a prophetic thing. So so first, let's, uh, we always want to start negative and work our way toward positive. So first of all, um, we're going to look at this act as a wasteful thing, okay? So the woman, Mary, if you connect those stories, had this jar of very, very expensive perfume, pure nard. Nard is an oil, an extract from the root of a plant that is, was probably grown in, in India at this time. Nard was extremely valuable and extremely expensive in first century Israel. Mark tells us that it was worth about 300 denarii. And just to give you um, kind of uh, a little bit of um, comparison, one denarii was what an average worker would earn for one day's labor. And so 300 denarii was, uh, as the scripture passage tells us, worth about an entire year's wages. And so work it out. 
uh, for today? What's, what would be an average salary today? About $40,000 maybe. And so this was a lot of money, a lot of money in this little container. This jar of perfume actually was probably a family heirloom handed down uh, from one generation to another and used uh, very sparingly because why would you waste something like this? Why would you just kind of waste something so valuable in one shot? Actually, um, I mentioned before, uh, this, this wasn't used as perfume. Actually, nard was primarily used in the process of embalming a dead body in preparation for burial. And, you know, apart from its direct use, it probably also was held by the family as some sort of financial security because, you know, if they got in trouble financially, um, at least they had this thing of value that they could sell and perhaps get them out of trouble. But needless to say, um, represented a very large amount of money. And it's actually Judas in the other Gospels that, that calculates the value of the nard poured out on the head of Jesus and, and deems it a total waste. In Mark, there seems to be a, a number of people criticizing Mary for her lack of stewardship. And the argument all sounds great on the surface. You know, oh, that could have been sold and the proceeds could have been used for the poor. However, Jesus responds in sort of an unexpected and, and extraordinary way. He says something that on the surface is almost kind of unJesus like He says, hey, the poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime you want, but you do not always have me. Now there's something, is it just me or is there something a little bit arrogant on the surface of that. I mean, if somebody were to say something comparable in this day and age in our circle of friends, we would probably think that person was either crazy or a little bit evil, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? So this is something that we should pay attention to. And you know, I would argue that this is very intentional by Jesus. And it's very intentional by Mark, the gospel writer as well, because this is an occasion where Jesus very, very clearly sets himself above all of that. He sets himself above the, the daily, the regular needs of humanity, and, and he puts himself in an altogether different category. So yeah, you might say that he's either crazy or evil, or else you might say that he is the Lord of all things, that he is truly the Son of God incarnate. And that, to tie it back to the passage, is precisely what Mary believes. And she wants to do something. She wants to do something for her Savior before it's too late. She wants to demonstrate just how much she loves him. And you know, as I was thinking about this, perhaps in a more rational moment or uh, a different time, Jesus might have said to her, yeah, this is, this is a beautiful thing that you want to do, but, but you know, it, you should sell it and give the money to the poor instead. But that is not what Jesus did here. That is not what Jesus did here. He did not chastise Mary. He knew that this was a genuine expression of her love for him, and so he received it. And this, I think, stands as something of a challenge to us. Because if you had been standing there watching Mary pour $40,000 worth of perfume on Jesus' head in one shot. Be honest. Wouldn't you have been tempted to say, ah, oh, that's just a waste. It's too extravagant. $50, $100 maybe, Can, but I can't. I just can't see the appropriateness in this. So that's... That's the viewpoint of this act of Mary upon Jesus as a wasteful thing. So let's move on to something a bit more positive. 
Second, this act is a beautiful thing. Verse 6, Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The New American Standard Version of the Bible interprets this a good deed. She has done a beautiful thing, a good deed. Mary took the most valuable thing that she had, and she gave it to Jesus. She gave it all to Jesus. This is how she expresses to Jesus what she thinks of him. She's filled with gratitude. She wants, to have him, she wants him to have it all. It's a gesture of devotion, a gesture of love, a gesture of sacrifice, uh, anointing him with nard so that she might demonstrate to him how she feels. John Calvin says, she was guided by the breath of the Spirit that ensure confidence she could do this in duty to Christ. Now, <clears throat> scholars throughout history have argued, I don't think harshly, I don't think it's come to blows, but they've had differences of opinion um, as to whether or not this was a premeditated act or whether this was a spontaneous act. Um, maybe you're curious about that, maybe you don't care, so um, you can just tune out for a minute because I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, but I believe that Mary planned to do this, okay? I believe that Mary planned to do this. She's the one who took this jar wish with her that night to the home of Simon the leper. This was not their home. Why else would she take this to the home of someone else? This was something between her and her Savior that she had thought long and hard about, and I think that's important. I also think it's important that, that Mary did not do this so that others might see it. She did not do this so that she would be praised by other people for doing this. She probably knew the risk of doing this and the criticism that it would draw. No, she did this because she loved Jesus above anything and everything else. And Jesus recognizes this and identifies what she did as a beautiful thing, a good deed. As I mentioned before, this stands as a challenge to us. Because look, I mean, is this just an ordinary man here? Is this just a, a noble prophet or a wise teacher? Or is this, in fact, the Lord incarnate? Jesus Christ, our Savior, prophet, priest, and king. And I want to make sure that you are seeing what is being communicated in this gospel account. What is being communicated is that there is something utterly unique about Jesus. There is something utterly unique about Jesus because he accepts and receives the worship of others. Not only does he accept it, but he expects it. And that is what it is all about. That is what the Gospel of Mark is all about, that Jesus is truly the Son of God. And so the extravagant offering of Mary is not a wasteful thing. It's a beautiful thing, completely appropriate, because this is Jesus. Which brings us finally to our last point, this act as a prophetic thing. See, in a sense, Mary anointing Jesus had been an act of giving to the poor. I wish I could say that was mine. That's from a commentary. She had given to the one who became poor for our sake so that we might become rich in him. Jesus himself says in verse 8, she did what she could. And then puts it all into perspective. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. And so Jesus understood what she was doing, and Mary understood what she was doing to some extent as well, because Jesus had been hinting already for some time what his trajectory was going to be and what his end was going to be. Think about Mark 8, verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, which was his reference to himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Or this, in Mark 10, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the 12 disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. 
Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And so the disciples were still in the dark about what Jesus came to do, despite Jesus telling them over and over again what the end was going to look like. But Mary, at this point, seems to understand what Jesus had came for. She seemed to understand that Jesus' journey was going to end in death, that Jesus was going to die. And she understood that she, he was going to die in the place of sinners like her. And so I think that this story, this story shows us that Mary is feeling some urgency in anointing and preparing the body of Jesus because she might not be able to do it when the time comes. Nevertheless, she is determined to give him a royal burial. She had been confronted by the gospel before it was even clear how the story was going to be played out. And she understood that Jesus was dying for her, for her sins, and for her guilt, and for her redemption. Jesus was paying the ransom price to set her free. Jesus was absorbing the just and, the just and righteous wrath of God in her place. And you see, because this story is told the way it is, we also have this sense of the struggle that's taking place. The struggle taking place in this very party where this beautiful thing, this good deed happened. In this very party, there's a struggle taking place, not just between the critics and Mary, not just between the Sanhedrin or the religious leaders and Jesus, but between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It is the ancient struggle that, that begins all the way back at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. The dragon is here, and he is entering into the heart of Judas. And that's what Mark encapsulates in this beautiful story, this beautiful story that's surrounded by trouble and darkness. Because it's not just Mary who understands the purposes of Jesus. Uh, Satan gets it too. He understands what is happening, and he's trying to prevent it. And so while the song of Mary goes something like this, uh, love so amazing, so divine, divan demands my life, my soul, my all, Satan is singing a different song, the song of betrayal in the heart of Judas. And what sets everything in motion is Judas watching $40,000 worth of perfume being poured on Jesus' head. I suspect that for some time now, Judas had been letting secret sin eat away at his heart. But it's this experience in Mark's gospel that drives him into the presence of the Sanhedrin, to those who were plotting to arrest Jesus, but were waiting for their moment. And Judas gives them their opportunity. In the darkness in Gethsemane, they, he would point Jesus out to them. They would take Jesus into custody and he would be tried and then he would be crucified. And then the chief priests would give Judas a reward for his betrayal. And so this is the story. This is the story where the secret sin in the life of Judah, Judas is about to take him away. Yeah, that's the, the vicious downward cycle of unrepentant sins driving Judas to do the unimaginable, not just to, to walk away from Jesus, but to reject him completely. But let me also tell you something about that last word in verse 11. They, the religious leaders, were delighted to hear what Judas has, had to say and, and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to uh, hand him over. Judas sought an opportunity to betray Jesus and, and to hand him over is the word. I want you to know that that's a very important word in the Greek New Testament. 
Paul actually uses it in Romans chapter 8 where he says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? See, that's important to understand because... It's not just Judas at work here, and it's not just Satan that knows what's going on. In the mystery of divine providence, God is bringing his purposes of redemption to fullness and climax. It is God who's handing over his own beloved son for the sake of people like Mary and for the sake of people like you and me. And I wonder this morning as we close from the depths of our hearts and souls... What measure of affection do we pour out upon Jesus as we consider what he has done for us? Amen. Let's pray.